Welcome back to the Religions of the Ancient Mediterranean podcast. My name is Phil Harland. I'm a professor at York University in Toronto. This series in the podcast is called The Historical Jesus in Context, and we're continuing in this episode with a discussion of problems in studying the historical Jesus that are rooted in issues regarding method, sources, and theory. In this episode, we continue the discussion of the sources and the limits of the sources we have in terms of what they can reveal to us as historians. We also discuss the criteria that many historians of the historical Jesus have used in the past. Criteria as to how to evaluate which things are more likely to go back to the historical Jesus, that Jewish peasant from Galilee, in terms of what he said and did. We also, in an overall way, sketch out the limits of historical method. Historical methods can only tell us so much, and they do not deal with certainties. They are tentative in many respects, and they deal with levels of probability. With historical methods, the best we can do is say that something is highly likely about the historical Jesus, or highly probable about the historical Jesus. There are many books that touch on these issues, but don't necessarily focus on them entirely. John P. Meyer's multi-volume works on the historical Jesus begin with the first volume talking about sources. However, in his case, he actually excludes sources that I would include in some respects, including the Gospel of Thomas. Other scholars do give more attention to sources like the Gospel of Thomas in their search for the historical Jesus. John Dominic Crossan's book on the historical Jesus develops a particular method which he is very explicit about, which is a good advantage to his approach. However, it too is a selective approach to how to study the historical Jesus. This current podcast is just a quick sketch of some of the difficulties we have in pursuing the study of the historical Jesus. In the next episode, we finally move on to some more substance, you could say, to some degree. We sketch out two main portraits of Jesus by modern scholars. E.P. Sanders on the one hand and John Dominic Crossan on the other. That will be in the next episode. Finally, we'll turn into good getting into some of the primary sources ourselves and studying them in the subsequent episodes. I hope you enjoy this podcast. last time we were outlining the sources we have. The whole point of talking about sources for the historical Jesus is to point out the limits of our sources. Namely, we don't, as historians, as modern historians, we don't really have what we would like to have in order to get at that peasant Jesus from Galilee. Historical methods are limited. They can only say so much, and when they do say something, they can only talk about probabilities. History isn't about truth. History isn't about certainties. History is about assessing evidence we have for something and saying with certain levels of probability whether or not something did happen this way or didn't happen that way. In order to approach any subject historically, whether it's looking at this peasant from Galilee or whether it's studying some figure from the Middle Ages or whether it's studying some modern historical figure even, This is compounded when you're dealing with the ancient context, partly because of the lack of evidence generally from the ancient world. So the problems the historian has in being able to write history in the ancient period is magnified compared to what it would be if you're trying to write medieval history or especially compared to modern history. So it's essential to look at the sources and be aware of the limits of the sources we have as part of the problem we have as a historian trying to get at a figure like the historical Jesus. So that's what the point of what we've talked about so far about sources is all about. We began with the Greco-Roman sources. It would have been nice to have a whole lot more of those because a historian likes to be able to have multiple sources from multiple perspectives to be able to compare them and be able to say something about a historical figure about an incident in history. The problem we've already seen with early Christianity and with Jesus specifically is that we have very few non-Christian sources. So that we did look at the couple we had and what they outlined for us in Josephus and Tacitus, Josephus a Judean historian 
who writes in Greek and Hebrew, and Tacitus, a Roman historian who writes in Latin, both of those guys happen to confirm something we get from Christian sources, namely that Jesus was executed using crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea. So we've already seen that, that that's, that's an important thing to find out because it, the way he died also, we'll soon see, has to be accounted for. And so knowledge of how Jesus died by crucifixion under a Roman governor has some corollaries for other things we can say about Jesus. We have to account for him being killed in that way. You don't get killed in that way by just sitting around in Nazareth, is another way of putting it. So even though our sources are very scant for Greco-Roman sources, they give us a certain bedrock to work with, with regard to Jesus, that everything else has to relate to. Any other less probable things we're saying about Jesus, remember that the most probable thing we can say historically is that he was executed under Pontius Pilate. Any other things we're going to say are going to be less probable than that, but they all have to still fit with the fact that he was executed under Pontius Pilate. So that's an interesting thing to mention about the corollaries of what we do know from the Greco-Roman sources. We then went forward to uh, well, Judean sources, including Josephus as a Judean, and to archaeological evidence. We've spent quite a bit of time in those tutorials uh, last week, at least a little bit of the time, talking about the value of archaeological evidence and the limits of archaeological evidence. Archaeological evidence will never tell us anything directly about Jesus. What it does tell us a lot about is what peasants were like in Galilee, for example. And Jesus is a peasant in Galilee. So it begins to give us information by contextualizing and can tell us more about Jesus through that means. A whole lot more. Because if we didn't have that archaeological evidence, if we couldn't say what a peasant in Galilee was like or what life in Galilee was like, we could hardly say anything at all about Jesus. Having that information about the general context gives us a framework to work with and some generalities we can say about what Jesus would be like as a peasant in living in Galilee. So that's what archaeological evidence from Judea and Galilee can give us. We finally moved on to the Christian sources. The Christian sources are our primary evidence for Jesus, obviously. The difficulties we've already begun to outline is that none of the sources we have by early Christian authors, or by any ancient author, is interested in telling us what we want to know. We as modern historians have to adjust to the fact that the ancient authors weren't interested in the same thing we are interested in as historians. So we have to work with the sources in a roundabout way and in a very careful way. A careful way that acknowledges what type of writing they are. So in the case of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, we're working with ancient biographies. We know that this was a type of writing, and we've explained that a little bit last week. A type of writing in the time. Ancient biographies were written in a way that was invested in the figure and that moralized and that deliberately spun the story of the figure in a way to try and convince you to do something, to behave in certain ways, to reject or emulate them. And so these aren't the types of sources a modern historian would love to have. They would love to have instead more descriptive sources about what Jesus did and said, as opposed to sources that want to get you to think something about that figure, Jesus. And so that's the problem we have. They're invested in what they're talking about, and they're explicitly moralizing without feeling a need to apologize for that. So that's where we left off, I think. Uh, and now we need to talk more about these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and also some other sources we have that contain sayings about Jesus, including the Gospel of Thomas. And sometimes we have sayings that have been discovered circulating individually in a papyrus fragment, say. The Egerton papyrus is an example of that. So we have this material to work with in talking about the deeds or the activities of Jesus and the sayings of Jesus. And then the historian's task, if it's possible, and we'll have to debate the, the, the degree to which it's possible, is to try and figure out, as a historian, which of the sayings and which of the actions attributed to Jesus can we say is more likely or less likely to have happened or more probable or less probable to have happened. 
But a preliminary to that is what we extensively discussed in the tutorial, but I want to summarize quickly. And that is, before you start asking the question of how can we use the Gospels and how can we start looking at them and figuring out historically what we can say about the peasant Jesus, you have to ask the question of how are the Gospels literarily related? So we explained that in tutorials. The synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're called synoptic because you look at them together. The synoptic problem is how do we explain the relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke? That one of the answers to the synoptic problem is this theory, the two-source or four-source theory. We've already established clearly in the tutorials that why it is that scholars have come to the conclusion that they're literarily related, namely that sometimes the Greek is precisely the same, which suggests one person copying from another source. So there's definitely a relationship between the Gospels. The question we tried to solve was what were the different theories scholars have come up with to explain who wrote first and who used what other source. The theory we are working with is the one I want to quickly summarize again. And that is called the two-source hypothesis, also sometimes called the four-source hypothesis. So in your textbook, Ehrman, he calls it the four-source hypothesis. Same thing as the two-source hypothesis, referring to the same theory. The theory is this, the two sources are Q and Mark, and those sources are the earliest. Matthew and Luke, independently, do not know each other, do not know each other's writing. But independently, Matthew and independently, Luke, use both these sources. So that Q ends up being used by Luke, and Mark ends up being used by Luke. Q ends up being used by Matthew, and Mark ends up being used by Matthew. This particular theory accounts for the almost precise Greek sometimes in Matthew and Luke that isn't in Mark by saying, by suggesting that there's a saying source. Quelle is the German word for Q. Could have been S if it was an English guy who first expressed the theory for source. The Q source is considered a collection of the sayings of Jesus primarily uh, with very little or perhaps no narrative progression. No discussion of Jesus went from here to there, or Jesus did this, or Jesus did that. It was primarily a collection of the sayings of Jesus, as scholars are hypothesizing it. This is our working hypothesis for our approach to the historical Jesus. If you chose a different working hypothesis on source criticism, on the relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would end up with a different historical Jesus to some degree. So this is another problem, isn't it? And getting at the Jewish peasant Jesus is there's a series of steps you take as a historian before you even get to the stage of starting to study Jesus. And that series of steps affects the result. So if you picked a different source theory, your construction of the historical Jesus may be different because you would think of different sources as earlier than others. But it shows you the tentative nature, and history is tentative generally, especially ancient history, the tentative nature of the results we'll get. They're based on a source theory, and then you're working with looking at the historical Jesus based on that source theory. Let's talk about the criteria that scholars use in order to establish uh, uh, what they believe Jesus said or did using historical methods. There's certain criteria of authenticity they're sometimes called. In other words, what criteria do we use to establish what authentically goes back to that Jewish peasant Jesus? And that isn't just a creation of, say, the Gospel of Mark. Let's talk about these criteria. First of all, historians who look at the historical Jesus have this issue of dissimilarity as one of the criteria of authenticity. What they mean by di dissimilarity is this. If there's a saying of Jesus, for example, in a gospel that you're reading, that the saying itself contains information that is different from what we know from most other Judean sources at the time, if something that's preserved about what Jesus says doesn't fit with the spin of the Christians and doesn't fit with the spin of most Judeans, it's dissimilar, in other words, it's more likely to be authentically by Jesus. This is the reasoning. There's faults in that reasoning. There's weaknesses to that, obviously. Embarrassment is an extremely important one. For example, 
the stories about John the Baptist, John the Immerser, John the Dunker. Episodes relating to John the Dunker are preserved in the Synoptic Gospels. And they involve Jesus being baptized by this figure, John. The thing about their presentation, Matthew's presentation, Mark's presentation, Luke's presentation, John's presentation, of Jesus interacting with John the Baptist and then being baptized, is just how embarrassed the authors are by it. Because it implies that Jesus is inferior to John the Baptist. For Jesus to go and join the movement of John the Baptist and be the protege of John the Baptist implies an inferior relationship to John the Baptist. So the idea is the fact that they're so embarrassed by it but still mention it means it really happened. They wouldn't have made it up is another way of putting it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke would not have made up the incident of Jesus being baptized by John the Baptizer because they all scramble to try and explain why it doesn't show that Jesus is inferior to John the Baptist. The Gospel of John simply does not even tell that Jesus was baptized. The point is this criterion of embarrassment. If the sources we have report something that they themselves are embarrassed about and try and explain away, then we've got something to work with in terms of a highly likely or highly probable thing going back to the peasant Jesus. That's the criterion of embarrassment. This next one is essential, a criterion that any historian uses no matter what period they're doing, multiple attestation. Multiple attestation as a criteria for establishing something as highly probable historically. You want to have multiple sources that tell you the same thing is a quick way of saying it. Now, on top of it being multiply attested, you want it to be multiply attested independently. So in the two source hypothesis, Matthew is independent of Luke. The two of them never knew each other's writing. However, they're both using Q. So in some cases, we would say, there's a saying in Matthew that's exactly the same as Luke. That is not multiple attestation independently, is it? Gospel of Thomas, another source that we're going to have to talk about shortly which could add another instance of something being attested independently if the Gospel of Thomas is independent. So some scholars think the Gospel of Thomas is dependent on the synoptics. Other scholars believe that the Gospel of Thomas is independent, did not know the synoptics. The decisions scholars make at various stages affect all kinds of things, don't they? The criterion of context, what I mean by that is that in order, a portrait of Jesus, a portrait of the peasant Jesus that a historian is trying to reconstruct, must fit in his context. You have to have Jesus fitting within Galilee in the first century, within Judea and Galilee, Israel as a whole in the first century, and within the ancient Mediterranean world in the first century. So this is where archaeology becomes important, and the whole issue of context and understanding the Greco-Roman context, the Judean context, and the Galilean context of Jesus. Because any hypothesis you give, putting together the various probabilities you have about this saying or that saying or this deed or that deed of Jesus, and then trying to, as a historian, have your hypothesis of the overall picture of Jesus you have, whether it's apocalyptic prophet, a wisdom teacher, a revolutionary, what have you, that overall portrait then has to fit within the context. You can't have a Jesus that doesn't fit in Galilee. Then the debates that scholars have come down to what was Galilee like? And then issues are debatable. What Galilee's like affects whether or not you can say, yes, Jesus does fit within my view of what Galilee is like. So uh, it's complicated stuff. Finally, that criterion I mentioned earlier today. Namely, any overall hypothesis about the scenario of what that Jewish peasant is best described as, apocalyptic prophet, wisdom teacher, what have you, has to account for his execution. If your overall scenario, dealing with some things that are highly probable, other things that are less probable, and some things that are likely, putting them all together, if that overall portrait you have of the historical Jesus doesn't explain well why he was executed by crucifixion, you're in trouble as a historian. I think you're getting this last point here, the nature and limits of modern historical methods.
and history writing. Things are always going to be somewhat tentative. Scholars are going to debate hypotheses. Scholars are going to debate method. Scholars are going to debate what source theory and how that impacts your picture of Jesus, etc. There's so many factors involved here, which helps to explain how we end up with very different portraits of Jesus within the most recent historical studies. I don't want you to be totally frustrated by all this, but it is frustrating that scholars trained in very similar methods who agree on many issues to do with how to do history, nonetheless come up with entirely different pictures of the, who the Jewish peasant Jesus was. And we're going to sketch out a couple of them. That concludes this episode. I hope you'll come again. In the meantime, you can browse my website at philipharlan.com. I like early Christianity. The opening music of this series in the podcast is Paradise Lost by Namgyal Lamo, a Tibetan artist. You can find her on the web and you can buy her CDs at Amazon.